last chapter a bit about um, how uh, male and female sex is determined using the sex chromosomes. And now we're going to talk about uh, the process of uh, fertilization, which happens before that, obviously, um, recombining of the uh, male and female gametes into one organism. So let's first talk about how sperm are, uh, how sperm develop and mature. And so each sperm consists of a haploid nucleus, a propulsion system, and a sack of enzymes that's required for the sperm to uh, penetrate and enter the egg. And so as you can see, we have our Golgi apparatus. And as this maturation process proceeds, uh, this Golgi will develop into the acrosomal vesicle. And the acrosomal vesicle, it will migrate to the anterior end of the sperm, and this vesicle contains the enzymes that are required for the sperm to enter the egg. And so um, these are digestive enzymes that will digest proteins and sugars that make up the outer coat of the egg. Um, and we'll get into that process a little more in detail um, as we go along. Um, also, you can see here that we have the centriole, and the centriole is the location where the flagellum will attach and develop. And you, as this process proceeds, you can see that the flagellum is getting larger. Uh, the flagellum will connect through the centriole at the posterior part of the nucleus. Um, in addition, the mitochondria, which are required for energy generation, will migrate and surround this growing flagellum. And as this happens, the excess cytoplasm that was in the cell is ejected. And so we don't need that anymore. We need to make a flagellum that's motile and we don't need excess fluid inside the cell because at this point, all the cell is, is a transport vehicle for that DNA, right? So its only goal is do everything it can to get that DNA into the egg to make another life form, another, another human uh, in this case. And so it doesn't need excess cytoplasm. All it needs is the DNA and the vesicle so it can get into the egg and the motor, so to speak, uh, the drivetrain of the sperm, the flagellum with the associated mitochondria that allow it to swim. Um, this figure is, it, I want to note um, that the sperm, actually the final product, this part right here, is actually much smaller than what we initially started out with. Because it's ejecting that um, excess cytoplasm and really everything except for the essentials, um, it's actually much smaller than the original cell. This, this image blew up the last uh, sperm so we could label everything, but it does get smaller as the maturation process uh, proceeds. So here we see a stained uh, version of the uh, of sperm. Um, the blue here is a DAPI stain, and that is the DNA. The green here is a GFP tag that is tagged to mitochondria. So you can see the mitochondria in the neck uh, of that uh, sperm. And then the red here is a stain that stains for uh, tubulin uh, within the flagellum. So tubulin is that. Uh, structural protein or structural polymer that um, makes up the flagellum and allows for the locomotion to occur. So in this uh, image here, we have another GFP tag, and this is staining for that acro <clears throat> excuse me <laughs> for that uh, acrosomal vesicle at the top. And so this is the very interior end. Um, and so if I were to kind of draw this um, sperm, it's kind of looking like that. Um, it's at the very interior end, so the part that's going to make contact with the uh, ovum is uh, where the acrosomal vesicle is because where it makes contact is where it needs to put those digestive enzymes uh, to be able to access uh, the egg. All right, moving on, we're going to talk about the egg here. Uh, and this is the, uh, an example of a sea urchin egg. Um, and as you can see, this is 
in the process of fertilization. And so what we have is this uh, vitiline em envelope, which is surrounding the egg. And then outside of that is this jelly coat. And within the jelly coat, which is this uh, uh, those sugars, those polysaccharides that surround uh, the egg, you can see that there are sperm that are making their way through that jelly coat to get into the egg. So all these little white specks that you see uh, throughout here are uh, sperm. And so uh, once they get through the jelly coat, they'll attach to the vitiline envelope and uh, via the uh, acrosomal process, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, one thing to point out is um, the pronucleus here. And so in some organisms, such as the sea urchin, uh, the nucleus is already haploid at the time of fertilization. However, in other uh, animals or, or organisms, such as mammals, the egg becomes haploid after the sperm has already entered. Um, so depending on what kingdom you're from or, or what type of uh, fertilization process you have, you could either be haploid at the time of fertilization or after you've been fertilized. So unlike the sperm, which is ejecting cytoplasm as it matures, uh, the egg continually actually grows and accumulates more things within its cytoplasm and accumulates more cytoplasm uh, itself. So you have uh, nutritive proteins, which supply energy and amino acids uh, for the early development. And this is like the yolk in a chicken egg. Um, you have ribosomes and tRNA, which are required for that early synthesis of proteins. Um, messenger RNA, which are uh, obviously mRNA is that blueprint for proteins. So these early proteins that need to be activated um, right after fertilization, uh, those blueprints need to be present. Um, you have morphogenic factors such as transcription and paracrine factors, um, and this provides positional information uh, to the developing embryo, so it needs to know what the anterior and the posterior accesses are. Um, and then you have, in some instances, protective chemicals. So if you're something like a frog or a fish uh, or a sea urchin where the eggs get laid out into the open water, that's a pretty harsh environment compared to an egg being inside the uterus of a mammal. Um, so you need UV filters in the case of like an amphibian egg in the water um, that might be exposed to UV light. Um, DNA repair enzymes is pretty ubiquitous across most uh, organisms. Um, antibodies, because if you're let out to uh, an environment where you're exposed to viruses and different uh, chemicals and proteins that might be harmful, um, you need something for protecting uh, you against that. And bad tasting chemicals. So if you're a yummy, yummy egg and uh, some animal is coming to eat you, um, you want to have something that might dissuade them from eating you. So you can have chemicals in this, these eggs that are bad tasting and, and will prevent uh, predation from animals. So depending on the species, um, sperm enter the egg at different time points uh, in regards to uh, meiosis of the female uh, ovum. And so here, this is a very abbreviated um, uh, meiosis uh, stages here. So we have uh, our primary oocyte that hasn't uh, undergone meiosis yet. We have the first metaphase, second metaphase, and then just the completion of uh, meiosis. So there's no, uh, we're missing telophase, anaphase, et cetera. So, but this is very abbreviated. And as you can see, depending on what type of organism you are, uh, so we have uh, some round, uh, roundworm, uh, mesozoan, uh, sea sponge, uh, um, clam, etc., and even uh, dogs and foxes. So these aren't all. There's some mammals in this too. We have um, sperm entering before meiosis has even started, and now and other organisms, um, such as um, a couple different types of worms, uh, a mollusk, um, a starfish, a lot of insects, the sperm will enter during the first metaphase. So it's starting the meiosis process. Um, in most mammals, fish, amphibians, um, we see that sperm will enter the egg during the second metaphase. So we're still not haploid yet, but we're well on its way. And then um, in sea anemones and sea urchins, 
like our example for, um, that is used a lot for fertilization studies, the sperm actually enters the egg after meiosis is complete. So surrounding the egg is the vitelline envelope. And this is an extracellular matrix that is involved with sperm egg interactions. Um, and it contains a lot of different glycoproteins that kind of wrap around to provide this protective coating. And what's very important to remember, now if you're a sea urchin or a frog or a fish or these animals that lay eggs in open water, right? So you know, you've seen uh, if you've gone to a lake where fish bed down and they make these little holes and they put eggs in there and then uh, other male fish come and let the sperm out into the water and then you get this um, fertilization event. Well, what's to stop sperm? If sperm are released into the water, there's just sperm all over the place in the water, which is kind of uh, interesting to think about if you go swim in a lake. But what's to stop a frog sperm from fertilizing a fish egg? Or what's to stop a trout, specifically that fish, uh, a sperm from a trout from fertilizing the egg of a bluegill? Well, the vitelline envelope is what is responsible for uh, selectively letting sperm infiltrate it. And so there is specific um, markers and, and glycoproteins that allow specificity of sperm to enter that egg and make sure that you don't have, you know, frog sperm penetrating and fertilizing the egg of a bluegill or, or something else. So here we have a transmission electron microscope image of the sea urchin uh, egg cell surface. And so a couple key things I wanna point out here are the microvilli. And these are these little processes that proceed from the egg uh, underneath the jelly coat um, that allow um, kind of uh, capture of sperm and it helps in sperm getting their acrosomal process um, in the right region to allow <clears throat> for entry into the egg. <clears throat> this is closely uh, covered by the vitelline envelope. Uh, as you can see, it's this kind of like layer uh, right there. Um, <clears throat> and underneath all this is the cortical granule. So we already had one issue in uh, fertilization where we don't want sperm from different animals fertilizing our egg. Well, the other thing that we don't want to happen in our fertilization that is polyspermy or multiple sperm fertilizing the same egg. And so uh, what the cortical granule does is it is a, it's kind of like the acrosomal vesicle. It's kind of a sac that contains these digestive enzymes and um, mucopolysaccharides and uh, uh, glycoproteins uh, and hyaline protein, um, which aid in preventing this polyspermy event, because we don't want to have uh, three copies of the genome. We want to have one copy from your mom, one copy from your dad, and we don't need a third because then uh, the fertilization is going to uh, not be successful or we're not going to have uh, a full development of the, the organism. So the cortical granule, we'll get into the mechanism, but that is um, responsible for preventing polyspermy from happening. So now if we were to look at a mammalian egg immediately uh, before phosphorylation, we'll see that we have uh, the egg itself, the ovum. Uh, we have the zona pellucida, which was the, were those glycoproteins that were surrounding it. Um, a polar body is a remnant of that meiosis pro uh, process that we saw uh, a couple slides back. And then surrounding that, we have uh, what we call uh, the cumulus. And so the cells of the cumulus are the cells that uh, were uh, uh, follicular cells that were nurturing the cell during the release from the ovary. Um, and so they're there to kind of uh, protect and take care of the egg. Now, if we were to kind of zoom out, you can see that again, we have uh, the ovum that is in the center here. And then all of this is the cumulus cells that are surrounding it. And so uh, the sperm must navigate these cumulus cells to get to the egg and be able to fertilize the egg. So now we're going to look at uh, sea urchin fertilization. Again, so this is external, it's not internal like in mammals. 
Um, and we're going to look at the process at, or what happens when the sperm actually makes contact uh, with the egg. So first, sperm locate the egg through chemotaxis. So there's a chemical gradient that's released uh, from the egg that the sperm will sense and it knows it's getting closer uh, when that signal gets stronger. So we'll talk a little bit more about this um, throughout this chapter. Um, but what happens is once the uh, sperm contacts the jelly layer, uh, we start to have this acrosomal uh, reaction that causes the acrosomal process to form. And so this is kind of uh, this little uh, spear tip that comes out of the uh, front of the sperm. And remember, the acrosome is what has all the proteolytic enzymes and uh, sugar digesting enzymes. And so this process uh, will start to release some of those proteolytic enzymes, as you can see, these little green dots, um, and they'll start to break down the jelly coat and as well as the vitiline envelope. And so the vitiline envelope is this pink uh, layer here. And so once it makes contact, those digestive enzymes will cause the, uh, the envelope to open up and it will bind with the membrane of the sperm and kind of make a little bridge in from uh, the inside of the sperm to the inside of the egg. And at that point, um, the, uh, the pronucleus, sorry, I was stumbling for that word, uh, the pronucleus of the sperm is able to um, be injected into the egg. And so at that point, that's where you combine the two genomes. So we talked about chemotaxis um, in the sea urchin. And so remember that is uh, that the sperm can sense and will respond to a chemical gradient. And so in this example here, uh, they injected 10 nanomolars of Resact, which is a sperm activating agent. Um, and so you can see kind of uh, here at zero time point, uh, the glass pipe pet tip. Um, and then you have, uh, let me get these times right. So we have uh, 20 seconds. Uh, and this first slide, and you can see that the sperm are starting to kind of congregate, congregate in that direction. Uh, and then uh, 40 seconds, you can see more and more of these sperm are going to this chemical signal. And then lastly, we have 90 seconds over here. Um, and so this is what sperm sense because obviously they don't have eyes or ears or anything to locate an egg, they use chemical gradients. So let's look molecularly at how this uh, chemotaxis process works. And so remember we have Resect uh, was our example from the last uh, slide and that is what attracts the sperm. So uh, naturally the sperm have to have a receptor for that and so we have RGC which is this uh, recept, uh, receptor. And so once this Resect binds to this receptor um, it causes a conversion of GTP to uh, GMP, and this energy is used to activate this calcium channel over on the right here and open it up. And so this calcium channel then allows for ca uh, calcium to flow into the sperm from the external environment. And this influx of calcium activates the motility of that flagella for the sperm, and the sperm will swim up towards that gradient towards the egg jelly, which is releasing uh, this resect. So here we see um, after being activated with that resect, uh, this is 125 nanomolars resect. We have a, a sperm here that's stained blue. You can see that in less than a second that this calcium gradient forms and is high concentration within the head of the sperm. And so it's a very quick process. And so you might also be thinking, okay, well, how does this still give us directional information, right? There's these receptors all over uh, the sperm, the head of the sperm and calcium flows in, but that still doesn't really give proper orientation to the sperm. Well, sperm naturally swim in a circular motion. And so if they have no resect, they'll just keep spinning and spinning and spinning and swimming this way. As soon as they sense a gradient, they straighten out. And so 
if they sense a little bit of that resect, uh, again, excuse my poor uh, mouse typing ability here. Um, so if they sense that resect, they'll straighten out. And so they'll be spinning, spinning, spinning. They'll sense the resect and they'll go straight um, because that calcium influx causes their tails to straighten out and swim in a straight direction. And as long as they're sensing more and more resect, along the way, because that gradient is going to get stronger and stronger, they're going to continue to swim straight. If they sense it and all of a sudden they accidentally go in the wrong direction, say for something happened to that gradient, the eggs got eaten or something, um, and they don't sense any more resect, well, they'll continue to spin again until they sense more resect and then maybe be, go in the direction of different eggs. So that's kind of how they, they sense their uh, environment and sense where the egg is and learn to swim there without having eyes. So remember, in these open water um, environments that these eggs are laid in for things like frogs and fish and uh, in our example here, the sea urchins, um, there needs to be a way to have uh, sperm specificity, right? You don't want sperm from a different species uh, trying to fertilize your eggs because you're not going to have the right chromosome makeup and yada 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 you won't have a successful uh, uh, organism develop. So um, what actually uh, there's this uh, well-studied series of organisms uh, in Rio de Janeiro uh, down in Brazil where there's three sea urchins that all cohabitat the same environment out in the ocean and so it was found that the eggs of these sea urchins when laid have jelly coats around them and what allows the acrosomal process to start that reaction and begin to fertilize the egg is actually the polysaccharides that make up the jelly coats of these eggs and so here you see we have three different um, sea urchins uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce these names um, but if you have sperm from the proper sea urchin paired with the eggs from it, you have a large amount of acrosomal reaction. But if you compare that with sperm and try to fertilize it with a different uh, sperm from a different organism, you have very little acrosomal reaction, almost none. And so looking closer at this, it's found that the polysaccharides are to play. So when we look at <clears throat> the polysaccharides that make up the jelly coat of these eggs laid by these uh, sea urchins, we see that different, uh, different uh, organisms or species of the sea urchin have different polysaccharide makeups of their jelly coat. So you can see that um, uh, E. lasunter, I'll, I'll guess that it's pronounced. Um, I'm by no means a sea urchin researcher. But um, as you can see, it has a very simple polysaccharide. Uh, while um, A. Uh, lixula has a much longer polysaccharide chain. Um, and so these are what make up uh, the specificity uh, filtering mechanism of the eggs is which polysaccharides are there. So the sperm are only going to bind with the polysaccharides from its same species to start this acrosomal process reaction. So let's look more closely at this acrosome reaction. And so uh, remember we have the acrosome that's at the very tip of the sperm here. And once activated, the portion of the acrosomal membrane that's lying directly beneath the sperm cell membrane, so that would be kind of right along this edge, um, it fuses with the cell membrane and releases the contents of the acrosomal vesicle. So the uh, acrosomal membrane and the cell membrane fuse together, which cause this uh, release of all those proteolytic enzymes. Um, and when this receptor of the sperm is activated, uh, it activates three specific proteins. And so there's calcium channel proteins, uh, sodium hydroxide exchanger pumps that pump sodium in in a hydro or in a hydrogen out uh, and then also uh, phospholipase enzymes, which cause a cascade that results in additional calcium 
being released from the acrosome. So all of this causes this cascade of events. Um, and what then happens is the membranes uh, fuse and the acrosome enzyme is acros acrosome enzymes are released. Um, but after that, this actin microfilament that was uh, globular actin early on, that starts to form this process that comes out, right? So we have these enzymes that are released and they're gonna start doing the digesting of the Vitaline envelope and the jelly coat, et cetera. Um, but we still need to form that, that process to actually bind to the egg membrane. And so at this point, the actin microfilament will start to form that process and these binding proteins will start to uh, populate the outside. We'll get more into binding in, uh, in a couple of slides here. Um, but at this point, the acrosomal process is formed. Those enzymes have been released and are kind of chewing through uh, to kind of make a gap for that sperm to get to the egg. Um, and we should have uh, fertilization. So we talked about how eggs have polysaccharides surrounding them in the jelly layer that make it uh, specific for sperm of their same species. But sperm also have a way to specify that they're only going to fertilize eggs of their same species. And that was that bindin protein that we talked about in the last slide. And so bindin is that little protein that will start to uh, surround that acrosomal process. And its job is to recognize eggs of the same species. And so in this experiment here, what they did is they took eggs, so all these big circles are eggs, uh, from two different species, and they added binding protein from two different species. And so you can see here that if you have eggs and binding from the same species, that they all start to bind up together, hence the name binding. Um, but if you were to mix eggs and the binding protein from a different species, then they do not bind together. They just kind of float around. And so this is true for um, the first species up here. And then if we look at the green species down here, if you add green eggs and purple uh, binding, there's no reaction. But if you add green eggs and green binding from the same species, then there is um, uh, aggre uh, aggregation and they start to um, bind together. So uh, just kind of a quick proof of concept that uh, bind-in receptors are, or bind-in proteins are only on the acrosomal process. Uh, here they took uh, polystyrene beads and coated them with bind-in receptors, which would be on the uh, egg of that species. And you can see that these beads covered with the receptor bind only to the acrosomal process. And if we were to um, do a uh, immunochemical labeling of bindin um, with this dab uh, precipitate, we see that this dark stain is where we are uh, indicating the presence of bindin. And so you can see that the acrosomal process is here and that binding is coding that process, but it's not if we were to look further down the head of the sperm, you see that there is no stain color. And so binding is only localized on that acros acrosomal process. So similar to that experiment with the polysaccharides from the jelly coat, uh, we can kind of measure the specificity of the sperm to bind to uh, the, or, uh, the binding receptor of the egg of its same species versus no species versus an opposite species. So as you can see here, we have a combination of uh, beads coated with the receptor and binding from the same species. And you see we have a very high number of sperm per bead, um, which is over on the left uh, axis here, you see sperm per bead. So we have 35 at its maximum. And then if we were to look at that same species, but with a blank bead that doesn't have a receptor, we have very low binding. If we look at a different species with a blank bead, we again have very low binding. And then if we were to combine a, two different species, uh, one species for sperm and one species for bead, we again have 
very low binding. And so this is just the reason it's about 5% is just kind of noise uh, in, in their data system. But you can see that pairing bindin and the binding receptor from the same species is significantly higher than the alternatives. So what happens if by random chance two nuclei from a sperm do make it into an egg? So we have three haploid nuclei. So what happens is normally there's 36 uh, chromosomes, but in this example we have 54 because we have um, an extra set coming from that additional sperm. And so they, um, the 54 chromosomes randomly assort uh, on the four different spindles. Now remember we have extra spindles because we have an extra sperm there. And so we have the 54 and during the first cleavage as you can see we're getting pulled in all sorts of different di directions because we have the four uh, poles that are not supposed to be there. Um, and so we have 12 getting pulled between here, 6 getting pulled between here, 18 between these two, 14 between those two, 4 between the middle two. So it's a big mess right now. And so what this leads to um, after the second mitotic division is we end up with eggs, or sorry, we end up with cells within the egg that have different numbers of chromosome complements. So you can see instead of having 36 what we're supposed to have, we have 34, we have 32, we have 24, we have 18, nothing matches. And so um, what happens is the embryo will then start to disintegrate. Like there's mechanisms for recognizing that there is not the right number of chromosome complements in each cell, and this will cause uh, the early death of the embryo. So this is just a very cool staining image uh, of what we just talked about. So as you can see, we have our uh, central centrioles and we have the spindle fibers coming and pulling apart the chromosomes. And as you can see, the chromosomes are orange here, um, but they're all lining up and getting pulled in different directions. Um, and so what this results in, because it's all random, is DNA or cells, uh, daughter cells that have um, the incorrect number of chromosomes. So there are two ways uh, that uh, eggs respond to sperm that prevent polyspermy. There's a fast block and a slow block. So this is the fast block where uh, the addition of sperm causes changes in the membrane potential. So like the charge across the membrane within uh, one to three seconds after fertilizing, the fertilizing sperm contacts the eggs. So what happens is uh, soluble components from the sperm cause the closing of ion gates across that membrane of the egg, causing a change in the potential of the membrane. Uh, and this leads to uh, preventative action that will not allow polyspermy to happen. So as you can see, uh, depending on those ion gates and the ions that are flowing across that membrane, you have a different amount of polyspermy. So if we can manipulate in sea urchins uh, the amount of uh, sodium that is in the water, and if you have uh, 490 uh, parts per million, then you have a very low, only 22% of the eggs are polyspermic, so they have multiple uh, nuclei from sperm. Now, if you decrease that, you change the voltage across the membrane because you have less of these positively charged ions that are uh, moving across the membrane into the cell, and that causes the number of polyspermic eggs to increase to 100%. So having, establishing this membrane potential across the membrane when sperms contact uh, the egg is very important in uh, regards to responding and preventing multiple sperm from donating their DNA into the egg. Now the slow block for um, prevention of polyspermy is the formation of a fertilization envelope and removal of the excess sperm. So at about 10 seconds after um, sperm enter, 
then you start the formation of this uh, fertilization envelope. Um, so at about uh, 25 seconds and 35 seconds, you see that this envelope is moving to surround the egg and it's kind of pushing off all these excess sperm who are now not able to access that vitelline envelope. Um, and then finally, um, all the excess sperm are removed um, after a minute or so and you have sealed off access from other sperm to that egg. So let's look at the formation of this uh, fertilization um, uh, envelope. So once the sperm uh, interacts with the egg, <clears throat> it leads to the cortical granule undergoing exocytosis and releasing these uh, cortical granule serine proteases, which are cortical granule serine proteases uh, right there, CGSP. And that's an enzyme that cleaves the proteins linking the vitelline envelope to the cell membrane. So it causes a gap between that envelope, uh, which is here, and the membrane, which is inside, which is represented by this uh, uh, gray line here. So you can see all this white area is kind of the gap that's being caused by this. So then <clears throat> mucopolysaccharides are released by the cortical granules uh, and they form an osmotic gradient causing water to enter and swell the spaces between the vitelline envelope and the cell membrane. So you get water that is coming across this membrane because of those mucopolysaccharides, and it starts to swell and open up that space more. <clears throat> um, and then this enzyme UDX1 down here, kind of almost by my picture down here, um, it's a, uh, formerly, formerly that was in the cortical granule, uh, granule membrane, um, and that catalyzes the formation of hydrogen peroxide, uh, H2O2, and that's the substrate for uh, soluble um, uh, avoperoxidase, which is this OVOP. Um, and so that starts the formation of this fertilization envelope down the line. Um, and so OVOP and uh, transglutamases, uh, which are these TG here, uh, also in the forming uh, fertilization envelope, they harden in that, uh, that vitelline, what was formerly the vitelline envelope, uh, is now the fertilization envelope. So if we look at uh, electron microscopy of an unfertilized and fertilized egg, on the left we have our unfertilized, we have our microvilli that are sticking up here, and you can see all these cortical granules that are still intact, um, and those contain those enzymes uh, and the mucopolysaccharides. And then after fertilization happens, <clears throat> remember the up here, we have the cell membrane and the vitelline membrane right next to each other. But after fertilization happens, uh, they pull apart and you can see that uh, the osmotic gradient has caused water and this, these big gaps to form. And we have the cell membrane way down here and then uh, our envelope uh, developing into the fertilization envelope way up here. And so um, you can see that this process um, not only creates a hard end envelope, but also like a, a distance barrier between the uh, cell membrane and that protective fertilization envelope. So in that previous slide, you'll have noticed that there are a lot of those cortical granules throughout the egg, right? It's not just one, um, there are quite a few of them. <clears throat> and so they all can be uh, activated to lead to the formation of the fertilization envelope. And uh, what it seems to be is that uh, a calcium wave is what is responsible for this, um, the activation of those cortical granules to form the, uh, the fertilization envelope. <clears throat> and so um, after fertilization, a wave of calcium is released uh, and it's, as you can see, it's on the left-hand side here. And as time goes on, this wave goes all the way across the egg uh, to the opposite side of where fertilization happened. And this happens in about 30 seconds. So it's pretty quick uh, that this calcium gradient moves across. Um, and this is what's responsible for those cortical granules um, to keep releasing those mucopolysaccharides and continue to build that vitelline envelope all the way around 
the entire sphere or sorry, convert the vitelline envelope into the fertilization envelope around the entire sphere. So here's uh, a probable mechanism, it's not fully characterized yet, of how uh, this calcium signaling uh, and this wave of calcium occurs. So <clears throat> uh, the sperm binds to the cell membrane of the egg, releasing all those uh, soluble uh, factors from the uh, acrosome and then you have um, tyrosine kinase which interacts with uh, phospholipase C or PLC and what PLC does <clears throat> as, after it's been phosphorylated by that kinase is it converts PIP2 into DAG and into IP3 and IP3 interacts with this calcium channel allowing an influx of calcium, likely from the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, if we were to look at these, uh, the sea squirts or the sea sponges, um, we see that the bind-in proteins are prevalent on the uh, process coming off of the uh, sperm. And so it binds to the bind-in receptor specific for its species. This receptor then phosphorylates a kinase, which again interacts with PLC, which again converts PIP2 into DAG and to IP3. On this calcium channel, there is an IP3 receptor, which allows it to open up. And again, we have that influx of calcium from the endoplasmic plasmic reticulum, where it's stored for this purpose, into the cytoplasm, where this signaling cascade can continue to move across the cell, activating those cortical granules. So now if we were to take this all together, we see that phospholipase C, remember, converts uh, PIP2 into DAG and IP3, which then, from the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, allows this calcium to come into the cytoplasm because this IP3 is bound to the receptor on that channel. Then, this calcium interacts with this, uh, or activates with DAG, this uh, sodium uh, hydroxide pump. And what happens is you pump uh, the protons out and you take sodium in, which causes a change in the alkalinity, um, and then results in this cortical granule excitosis. So that calcium channel through or this uh, stimulation from phospholipase C to make IP3 causes activation of that calcium channel and release of calcium into the cytoplasm from the endoplasmic reticulum that leads to the activation in combination with DAG of this sodium uh, hydrogen exchange pump which brings sodium in which causes changes in alkalinity and then uh, exocytosis of the cortical granule, which then leads to the expanding fertilization envelope. So all that put together is, is how this uh, slow process of uh, preventing polyspermy occurs. So uh, just for your reference, here is kind of a list of some of these um, activities that happen during fertilization and also the approximate time post sperm egg binding that they occur. So you can see the early responses, we have uh, that potential change of the membrane, um, sperm egg membrane fusion, uh, the first calcium increase is detected at 10 seconds, um, the excitosis uh, starts at from 15 seconds to 60 seconds, um, but then uh, sperm entry, uh, where the actual um, pronucleus is put in, is about one to five minutes. Um, you know, mitosis and first cleavage are uh, over an hour after uh, this process. So you can kind of get uh, a bit of a uh, contextualization of, of what processes are happening at what time um, uh, after fertilization. So how do these 
once the pronucleus of the sperm enters the egg, how do the two nuclei, pronuclei, combine to make one nucleus with a full complement of the genome? So this is kind of a time-lapse uh, photograph showing the migration of egg pronuclei and sperm pronuclei towards each other uh, in a, a, a sea urchin again. And so it's a little difficult to see, but the sperm nuclei, which is up at the top here, um, it's this circle, and you can see there's a whole bunch of lines radiating off of this. Um, and so this is a microtubule network um, that is emerges from the sperm nuclei called an aster, an A-S-T-E-R, uh, for those of you keeping track. Um, and <clears throat> this network will interact with the microtubule network already present within the uh, egg, and it kind of provides uh, tracks, so to speak, um, that the nuclei can use to navigate. So there's motor proteins that will connect to the nu uh, pronuclei, and they'll use this actin or uh, microtubule network to move towards one another where they can combine then and form one full nuclei. So as you can see from this fluorescent image here, uh, we have our sperm pronuclei, which is much smaller because remember it's got to be packaged very small and tight and all that's in there really is the DNA. Um, and then these microtubules, the aster radiates out from it and it will migrate towards this larger female pronuclei where they will converge and create one full uh, nuclei with both the male and female components of the genome. So lastly, I want to end on a kind of a cool little uh, aside that is um, found in nature. And I actually um, got to meet with the researcher, her name's Hopi Hookstra um, at Harvard, who discovered this. And what she studies is these little beach mice that live down in Florida. And these mice have a lot of, the females have a lot of males trying to uh, mate with them all the time. And so as you can imagine, um, once uh, they've been inseminated by multiple mice, there's competition to see whose sperm can get to uh, the egg faster to ensure that they're the ones reproducing with that female. And so this has led to an evolutionary adaptation where um, sperm from the same mouse, so if you have um, the same genes as your neighboring sperm because you came from the same male mouse, they team up to swim faster than the sperm of a competitive or a rival mouse who might be trying to impregnate this mouse. And so what happens is they have these little uh, proteins on the heads of the sperm that only link with similar proteins. So this is kind of like that bindin or those um, uh, polysaccharides for within the, the jelly layer. Um, so if you're from the same mouse, you bind together with your similar sperm, and then you have a whole bunch of tails that are swimming in the same direction, so you're actually going faster. So it's kind of like a teamwork approach. We're all, here we have one, two, three, four, five uh, of these flagella are all gonna be pushing this group of sperm to the front faster than if it was by itself. And so um, it's kind of this cool little evolutionary adaptation uh, where if you are trying to pass your genes to the next generation, you're at an advantage to have your sperm working together. So that ends this chapter and we'll see you in the next chapter.